I'll start recording. Uh, JP, please turn your uh, video on. We need. <laughs> okay, so we have to take quiz three, right? Okay. Um, so uh, go ahead and open up your Canvas. week five and you've got a quiz um. and everybody ready So you have a passcode. It is maternal with an uppercase M. Maternal. Go ahead and start your quizzes. Remain um, muted. And <clears throat> when you're finished, you can just turn your camera off that way. I'll know you're done.
Okay. Everybody, turn your cameras back on if you turned them off. All right. So this week, uh, we have your your third quiz. Um, and you have your second set of calculations to get finished by Sunday. Some of you have already done those, which you're ahead of the game. And then if you've not scheduled a time to meet with me to remediate your exam, if you made less than a 78, you need to do that. Um, and if you made more than 78, if you made an 82, you might want to consider seriously meeting with me to go over the, the most common things, uh, which I might do at the end of this class anyway. Um, last week, if you didn't finish your discussion post from last week, I haven't graded them yet. I'm not. I'm kind of behind in my grading. But if you didn't finish it, please go ahead and get that completed so you can get every point counts when it gets to the very end. So get that completed. Mm -hmm. And then this week, um, you have your second discussion question is all that you have other than your OB calculation. Next week. It's the week before your next exam. Okay, so week six, once again, you'll have an NCLEX question to do. We will have another quiz next week. And then you have a case study to do next week. So I just thought I would throw that in. Okay, so this week we're starting talking about clients. Now that we've been through antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum in a whirlwind, we're going to talk about what difference that makes if we have a client with diabetes or if a client has lupus. And we're going to talk about what would happen if our client developed a problem during pregnancy. So usually high risk situations that become that way during pregnancy, not before, but during pregnancy doesn't occur before the 20th week. So usually 28, 30 weeks, we might see some things that indicate we need to go ahead and diagnose our client as high risk if she develops high blood pressure. Okay, during pregnancy, she's considered high risk. Okay, she might develop what's called preeclampsia or some things might be going wrong with the fetus, like the placenta. Where is it located? Or is her cervix too short? So there's a lot of things that we cover that are considered high risk this week. But I, even though it's a lot of information, I want to encourage you that the next two exams are pretty straightforward, okay? You're not going to be asked about developing countries, okay? Or socioeconomic barriers. Some things that you probably don't think about a whole lot unless you watch a lot of news. Um, in particular, CNN um, is a great channel to watch if you want to know world information, what's going on in the world and what's being affected by it. Or if you read um, any uh, medical journals, nursing journals, you might have a better idea what's going on in the world. So we're not going to talk about the world. We're going to talk about high risk patients. Okay. So I did uh, give you a document. Um, about it has a list of diagnosis diagnoses on it, and these clients with these diagnoses are considered high risk. So I'm going to share that. It's a word document, and it might be a little small, but you do have this document. Do you see it? And where is this actually located? Because I didn't. I didn't see that one. Maybe I overlooked it. Okay. Not a problem. In your announcements, I've got my announcements showing up. If you look down here, it says, welcome to week five. OK, 
Okay, I have obesity in pregnancy, risk associated with obesity pictures. And then I have some other information here and then the documents down below. Is everybody able, did some, was someone able in this class download these documents and print them? Jen, did you get them all printed? Okay. Yes. Okay, so high risk, it says high risk diagnoses. That's what I'm showing you uh, in a minute, okay? So you need to download all these documents. You don't have to print them out. You can just save them on your computer if you want to save paper, okay? And so you also notice that I put slide numbers in these documents because I was trying to give you a little bit of idea of what might be on your quiz, okay? So if you had a chance to do that, that's good. Um, so let me stop that one and open up that other one. So here's that document, Janae. Okay, so it's kind of hard to read uh, in this format. Let me see if I can enlarge it a little bit. Okay. So let's start with the first one. Now you'll notice in this document, I've got yellow highlights. Okay. That means you don't have to know everything on here. But I want you to get the idea that if there is a pre-existing disease, it's going to affect the pregnancy or vice versa. Pregnancy could affect the disease. So if you have a client with hypothyroidism, um, every client that comes into the office, uh, we do a baseline thyroid function. Okay, so we're going to draw a TSH. Okay, it's just measuring uh, how much that thyroid gland is working. Okay, if our client has low thyroid circulating, we need to give her some. Okay, we need to prescribe some medication because low thyroid levels, a fetus needs the mother's thyroid hormone because a fetus cannot make its own yet. Okay. So what we find is low thyroidism, hypothyroidism uh, prior to pregnancy and early pregnancy can actually cause problems with neurodevelopment in the baby, um, cognitive delay. Okay, It can also cause all these other things. Uh, thyroid is a hormone that we need for metabolism, for growth. Okay, so it's really important. So if we have a hypothyroid client, we need to make sure we get those levels normal again. So we prescribe it. On the other hand, hyperthyroidism means that the levels are too high. And these aren't as, this isn't as serious. Uh, we're not super aggressive uh, with bringing down um, thyroid levels as we are with hypo trying to get them up. Uh, usually if the, if a woman is hyperthyroid, she's going to have more trouble and be uncomfortable than it affects the fetus. But it can cause a defect in neurodevelopment. Or I'm sorry, it, it can cause a risk for preeclampsia, just like um, hypo. So preeclampsia, preterm birth, gestational hypertension, miscarriage are common outcomes of clients with chronic diseases. Okay, especially diabetes. Okay. There is another disorder, and you might have heard it before. It's called PKU. Um, the proper term in your text is phenylalanine hydroxylase deficiency. Okay. So this is basically saying very simply that a client is missing an enzyme. Okay. They, it's a genetic disorder. They're missing an enzyme that breaks down a certain protein, which is phenylalanine. Okay. If a client has this disorder, this genetic disorder, then they are going to have trouble make, maintaining a pregnancy. What we want to do is monitor their uh, phenylalanine levels before they get pregnant, and we want them to be normal 
for at least three months before they get pregnant. Just like ideally we want a client to be on folic acid for three months before they get pregnant. That's the most ideal situation, okay? Uh, phenylalanine levels. So for example, if we have a client come to the office and she tells us that she has the PhD, okay, the PKU disease, then we need to make sure she gets those levels down. If not, too much phenylalanine circulating in the mother's blood because she's eating food with that protein she's not supposed to, it can cause neuro neurological damage in the fetus as well, okay? So we need to get her tested or get her levels low. We do routinely um, screen all newborns for PKU, okay? If a mother has PKU levels that are high, she can't breastfeed, and okay? She can't breastfeed. Anemia, you're talking about anemia now in med surge. There's all kinds of anemias, right? There's iron deficiency anemia. There's folate anemia. There's chronic anemia, unknown etiology. There is um, thalassemia anemia. There's all kinds. In pregnancy, we're usually talking about iron deficiency anemia. Okay. So if we have a client that that struggles with iron deficiency anemia, then she's going to be anemic during her pregnancy. So we need to make sure we support her with a, uh, iron, okay, iron supplements. If she has a B12 deficiency, we can do a, um, it's called a hemoglobin electrophoresis to determine what kind of anemia she has. Um, measuring the, um, the M MHC, MCH, what is it? MCH, corpuscular hemoglobin, okay? We can determine what kind and how to treat it, okay? So we can do, um, uh, so if we, we give her iron, you know, iron can only be given on an empty stomach or with orange juice, okay? And, and the client needs to wait an hour. If the client is on thyroid and iron medication, both of those have to be taken on an empty stomach, but they can't be taken together at the same time. They need to be like six hours apart. So that gets kind of complicated. Um, seizure disorders or ep epilepsy. Uh, clients with epilepsy are at risk during pregnancy because the threshold is lower. In other words, a client will be more apt to have a seizure during pregnancy. So most of the time, we have to increase their uh, anti-epileptic medications or change them around to make them safe. We also want our clients to keep a, a journal. If they have a seizure, they need to let us know ASAP, okay? Now, during a seizure, um, clients don't breathe. So it is a risk to the fetus. So if she has something called status epilepticus, one seizure after another, the baby's not going to survive that, okay? So we need to make sure she understands how important it is for her to take her seizure medications, okay, during her. And I found uh, my clients that were, in, were epileptics really didn't want to. And they would say something like, oh, I haven't had a seizure for two years and I haven't had any medications. She needs to understand uh, that she's more prone to seizures because she's pregnant. So we need to get her to see the neurologist uh, to let him know, him or her know that she's pregnant. Let's see here. Okay, so now multiple multiple sclerosis is a what we call a, it's a demyelination of the spinal cord and the uh, central nervous system so demyelination it's just talking about the nerves that they're not coated with a certain sub substance that allows for electrical conduction 
Okay. So in other words, certain nerves are not functioning anymore. So multiple sclerosis, one of the first changes that a person uh, will experience if they have a new onset of MS is visual changes. Okay, you might have remembered hearing about that in health assessment. We talked a little bit about multiple sclerosis. Visual changes is usually the first sign. And then weakness in the muscles. And usually it starts at the lower extremity. Okay, They even might have some numbness. numbness. Um, what you need to know about multiple sclerosis is not an autoimmune disease. Okay? It's just a, an onset. We don't know what causes it. We usually assess vitamin D levels. Um, they're at risk for depression, and that makes sense. Okay, Pregnancy doesn't affect multiple sclerosis. In fact, during pregnancy, the signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis actually abate. In other words, there's some remission that occurs. They feel better when they're pregnant. Okay, so it, it's a it's uh, for some reason they do. They tend to feel better when they're pregnant. So multiple sclerosis really has no influence on pregnancy. Okay, if they still have signs, it's just going to be fatigue. Okay, and we just want them to see their neurologist and stay in touch with, with the specialist. And then the autoimmune disorders that we think about during pregnancy, um, lupus, you've heard of that, and then myasthenia gravis. These two are considered autosomal recessive disorders. Um, and there's other autosomal disorders or autoimmune disorders. Um, not autosomal, autoimmune disorders um, also, but in particularly lupus. Um, now, you're not going to be tested on lupus, but because I have taken care of a lot of patients with lupus, um, they are, you know, lupus affects the lungs and the vascular system and the kidneys. Uh, usually a client will have one particular area. My very One of my very first clients I ever had after I graduated from nursing school, I was working in med surg and it was, it was, it was acute care. It wasn't critical care. It was acute care. And I had a late stage um, uh, lupus client and she was a very bitter woman and she was in her forties, which to me at that time, she was old, but really forties is young to me now. And, and it is a young age. We got life expectancy now, you know, in the nineties. So, uh, but she had severe lupus and it was in her lungs. So she had res a lot of respiratory treatments and she just wasn't doing well. Um, she, so if she were to get pregnant um, at a younger age, she's going to be at risk for preterm, preeclampsia, all the things that can go wrong during pregnancy. Okay. Inter inter intrauterine growth restriction. Okay. Stillbirth. We treat autoimmune diseases with steroids across the board. Steroids are the best way to treat them, okay? Because what it does, it shuts down the immune system, it doesn't shut it down, but it makes it quiet. And you know, during pregnancy, the immune system is already quiet. So these people tend to feel better during pregnancy. Okay, They go into more of a remission. Um, we do put them on a low dose aspirin. Uh, we can also, if they still have a lot of aches and pains, we can give them Plaquenil. It's safe during pregnancy. Um, so we usually monitor these because these um, pregnancies, uh, especially during that third trimester, doing more frequent ultrasounds to make sure the baby is thriving and growing adequately, uh, or we need to deliver early. What you'll sometimes see is the baby stops growing. So maybe at the fifth percentile. And if the, if the mother's 34 weeks pregnant and they come back the following week and they're still at that low growth rate, we're going to go ahead and induce labor or do a C-section because the baby's not going to survive if it's not growing in utero. And there's a greater chance for survival outside the womb. Okay. 
So once the pregnancy is over is when clients with lupus or any kind of autoimmune disease, they have a flare up in the disease. Okay, so that's kind of difficult for them. But they can usually carry, a uh, woman with lupus can usually carry a baby to uh, nearly full term. Myasthenia gravis is the other one. That's an autoimmune disease. And this is right at the um, nerve and muscle connection. You know, the nerve is what's innervating the muscle to move. So uh, what happens is that the acetylcholine is destroyed and uh, the muscle cannot contract as easily. So what you're going to see uh, for, uh, what I want you to remember about myasthenia gravis is that the respiratory system is affected more than anything else. Respiratory muscles get very weak. And so they're affected by um, uh, the myasthenia gravis. You might see some facial drooping on one side or the other, um, um, a weak tongue, uh, eyes might be drooping. Um, and then the newborn, the baby she delivers are, is affected by this. So temporarily anyway, the baby, the newborn might have some respiratory depression, but it will improve and go away for the newborn unless they also have the disease. Okay. So respiratory weakness is mother and then subsequently in the newborn, a transient. Okay. So with these clients with myasthenia gravis, uh, we're not going to give muscle relaxers. We're not going to give anything that could affect the ability for her to push. Now, if we do an epidural, uh, which we will, uh, we have to really monitor her carefully. Marfan syndrome is about, it's an autosomal uh, dominant um, inheritance. So Marfan syndrome has to do with heart defects, in particular, the aortic valve. So Marfan, uh, women with Marfan syndrome, um, sometimes it depends on the condition of the aortic root. Uh, we might not want them to labor. It might be better to do a C-section. You really don't have to know about Marfan syndrome. Substance use, substance use disorder. Okay, or you might call it drug abuse. Um, but remember, that includes alcohol. That's why we say substances, substance abuse, anything that can affect the well-being of the fetus. So any substance. So, you know, we screen everybody for substance use at the beginning of the pregnancy. And if they have um, THC or cannabis or some kind of opioid metabol um, uh, metabolites, uh, heroin, anything like that in their urine, then we're going to randomly assess them throughout their pregnancy and encourage them to avoid use. Okay. Um, if they're open to going into rehab as an outpatient, where we can prescribe them some Subutex, uh, also known as buprenorphine or some methadone, then um, the baby's going to be much safer. The mother's going to have, not going to have any withdrawals. She has to avoid the other opioids. Um, and this is beneficial for mother and baby because once that baby's born, then she could breastfeed. And that allows that baby to wean off of opioids. But if she, if she still uses full strength opioids, she's not going to get her subutex nor she get any methadone if she's using street drugs. So we don't want her to breastfeed then. Make sure if you have a client with substance use disorder that you're also screening for intimate partner violence, screening for depression, because um, depression and substance use go hand in hand. Okay, so we don't wanna miss out on something else going on with our client that we can help address. Cardiovascular disease. Well, we talked about st starting week two, the demands of, on the heart of a woman who's pregnant. Remember, we've got larger amount of cardiac output, um, demands for more oxygenation. 
higher metabolic rate. So it's hard on the heart to get pregnant. And if you have a client with a pre-existing cardiac disease, it's going to be really hard to get through pregnancy to help prevent any kind of cardiac failure or pregnancy loss. Um, increased work of the heart muscle, overwork of the heart muscle can cause a woman to go into heart failure. Um, I had a client who she was very complex. She was 32 and she came in, she was a diabetic. And she had an A1C. If you're familiar with A1C, her beginning A1C was 12%. In other words, most of her blood sugars were well into the 200s. Okay, she was not in control of her hyperglycemia. And she came to us at 10 weeks pregnancy. We don't normally do an A1C, but she told us that she was pregnant. I mean, she told us about her diabetes and we went ahead and did it just to get some kind of an idea because uh, she said she wasn't very good about taking her medications. Um, she was hyperglycemic most of her pregnancy and she was able to carry her baby, but the, but the baby had some deformities because of the hyperglycemia earlier in her pregnancy. Okay. She ended up going into heart failure. Okay. They, she had, um, Cardiac uh, overload, uh, cardiac failure, and we had to give her, uh, she was in critical care for several weeks after she delivered, before we stabilized her. Um, she, we just about lost her. Uh, we had to give her diuretics and treat her like a cardiac failure patient. Um, you need to be familiar with what you would, what clinical signs you would see in cardiac failure. Okay, just like you were supposed to know hemorrhagic shock syndromes for pregnancy, uh, postpartum. So remember that there's a lot more cardiac output. Okay, the heart is working a lot harder. And then labor is working even harder. We've got this fluid, all this excess fluid that her heart has to circulate. And then once that baby is born, all that extra blood and fluid from the uterus is pumped right back into her system, her systemic circulation. So postpartum is the most serious time for a patient with heart disease. It compounds, it snowballs. Okay. Um, um, Peripartum cardiomyopathy. We do not know why some women with no heart disease develop cardiomyopathy after delivery or late pregnancy. Okay, there are certain uh, groups of people, uh, older women, older than 30, African Americans, obese women, uh, women who've had multiple children, uh, preeclampsia, maybe chronic hypertension, all these things. Um, put a woman at risk for developing a cardiomyopathy. So myopathy means damaged muscle, okay? Or in a um, less functioning muscle, okay? So a muscle that doesn't work as well. So the heart doesn't work as well. It's not necessarily necessarily in failure, but it's not working, working as well. The mortality rate is really high with cardiomyopathy. And usually uh, within five or six years, these people don't survive. Um, we're getting better about longer term um, life, but it's, it's scary. So just remember with all cardiac patients, we're not giving the drug terbutaline. Write that down, little note. No terbutaline. Terbutaline is a beta agonist. It's going to increase the workload of the heart. And it can also cause high blood pressure. Avoid Valsalva maneuver or closed glottis pushing. That was on your exam. Avoid um, methogen or methyl ergonavine. know the signs of failure. So heart failure or poor muscle pumping 
your client is going to be short, have shorter breath, dyspneic, coughing, a dry cough, okay, would probably have bibasilar rails, in other words, uh, ronchi in the lungs. They're going to be pale, cool, with clammy skin, and they may go into shock. So the tachycardia will begin because the heart is trying to compensate for its failure. Okay, the rest of this is um, about pain management. I think I did give you this just so you can study it, um, and partic particularly the, the job of the nurse with, with um, during an epidural. So the most important things on that sheet are the things I highlighted in yellow. Any questions about that? Okay, just a lot of stuff, huh? Okay. What else do I have for us? So it's also in some of the other videos and stuff that I, um, uh, on the PowerPoints, but I want to show you a picture real quick. You need to review um, for high risk, and of course, for any neuro patient, what the, where the deep tendon reflexes are, because we need to learn, we need to assess deep tendon um, reflexes. So I want you to go over those, um, and during pregnancy. We usually, uh, when our client has preeclampsia, we do the clonus, which is at the very bottom, the, the dorsiflexion of the foot. So clonus means if you dorsiflex the foot, pushing it forward towards the leg and then let go, it'll rhythmically oscillate. So it'll bounce back and forth. And that would be considered a positive clonus. Okay, a positive clonus, anytime your reflexes are hyperactive, it means that you're close to having a seizure. It means that the central nervous system is irritated. So we'll be going over that again. So I, I, I gave you this one as well um, for you to review. It's just one slide. Obesity in pregnancy. So normal weight gain, we know the first four weeks, one to four pounds. After that, um, during that second uh, trimester, we're looking at one and a half to two pounds per week. So 25 to 35 pounds weight gain is acceptable. Okay. So I put the BMI um, scale here for you as well. You know that anything less than 18.5 is considered being underweight. Obesity starts at 30. So if we have a client that is obese before she gets pregnant, number one, that's not in here, uh, miscarriages. It's hard uh, sometimes for a very obese woman to even carry a pregnancy, okay? Uh, she's at risk for stillborn, which would be a full-time um, uh, pregnancy that was born dead, okay? So she's at risk for that as well. She's at risk for developing diabetes during the pregnancy or developing hypertension during the pregnancy, delivering her baby extremely premature. And then of course, difficulty with labor, labor dystocia, preeclampsia. So obesity is not a good condition to be in when you get pregnant. So that's why preconception counseling is really important 
Um, Cause we want a woman with a BMI greater than 30 to lose some weight before she gets pregnant. So let's talk about um, uh, high risk pregnancy. Okay, so we're going to talk about diabetes in particular. Um, now you haven't, you won't learn about diabetes, I don't think, until uh, mid surge two. Is that correct? You're not learning about that now, are you? Okay. All right, let me find you. I just got to get everybody here. So we have a client. Let's see. Bear with me here while I play with my computer. Okay, so this is an example of a high-risk client, okay? She is, Adriana is her name, and she's 32 years old, okay? She's married, she's Hispanic. She's had one, she has uh, one child. And today, she presents with her third pregnancy, okay? So during her very first pregnancy, she was 28 years old. And during that pregnancy, she developed what we call gestational diabetes. Okay? In other words, she had hyperglycemia at a high enough level during her pregnancy to become a diabetic at that time. Okay, And during that very first pregnancy, her um, glucose was high enough that we actually had to treat her with some anti-diabetic medications. So we gave her some glyceride to take. She did deliver that first pregnancy early at 36 weeks. Okay. And then two years later, uh, she was actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Okay. And then she became pregnant um, the second pregnancy. Or she take, became pregnant the second time. So now with her second pregnancy, she has type 2 diabetes. Her first pregnancy, she didn't have it. She developed a gestational only diabetes. Okay. So when she turned 30, she was diagnosed with type 2. This is, this is, I, this is what I saw in my practice with my clients, my Hispanic clients. Um, if I've never seen them before and they were coming in to me for the very first time, and they were 30 years old and, and they told me that they had gestational diabetes with a previous pregnancy. My concern at that time was they already had type two at this point, okay? Because gestational diabetes will become type, a uh, client that has gestational is, is more at risk to develop type two after the pregnancy. And so between pregnancies, she developed type 2 diabetes. And this is what happened with Adriana, okay? Is everybody following me or totally confused? Okay. All right. So she was diagnosed. And so she's now in her second pregnancy, okay? And she's at 33 weeks and she goes into labor. So preterm. And she delivers a stillborn baby, okay? Not... I mean, it's a risk if you don't control your glucose um, to deliver a stillborn baby. So now she's coming in with her um, uh, third pregnancy. Okay, Her first pregnancy, she was 28 years old. She had gestational diabetes. She developed type 2 diabetes. Her second pregnancy, she had a stillborn baby. 
because she was a type 2 diabetic. Now she comes in today to see us and she's pregnant again, number three. Okay, so her GTPAL is listed below. G is three, right? One, two, three pregnancies. She's not had any full term babies. Both of her babies were preterm. One did not, she's not had any miscarriages. One did not survive. So she just has one living child, okay? Well, that was the preterm neonate at 36 weeks, okay? That's the picture we have here. So with this third pregnancy, what are your concerns as her nurse? I, of course, answer the question here. What are your concerns? How is her glucose levels? Okay, so she's a type two diabetic and here she is pregnant again, number three. So we, not, we need to know, um, are you checking your glucose? What have they been? Okay, what else would you wanna know about Adriana? Diet. What, what medications is she taking? Okay, yeah, what is she on a particular diet? Is she, does she what about her nutrition? What is she on any anti medic anti um, diabetic medications or any medications? What is she taking? What else you want to know? Or what else are you concerned about? Her family history. Okay, yeah, we want to know about her family history. You know, um, did anybody in her family have preeclampsia? Because that means she's at risk, okay? What about this? The fact that her last baby was stillborn. Do you think that'll affect her? She could be on some type of like antidepressant medication. Okay, yeah, we certainly need to screen for depression in our history. But her last pregnancy, she delivered a stillborn. Do you think that affects her now with the next pregnancy? Yeah, she's probably already thought about, what if I have another stillborn? So she's gonna need some emotional support. She's gonna need a lot of TLC during this pregnancy. So we want her to come in more often. So a lot to think about, right? Okay. So just some background information. Um, we are predicting that by the year 2050, that nearly 33% of US citizens will have diabetes. That's huge. Right now, our obesity rate is greater than 33%. Obesity and diabetes, they go hand in hand, okay? If you're obese, you're gonna tend to become diabetic easier. Because all of that adipose tissue you have is considered inflammatory tissue, and that increases glucose levels. Okay. So, usually in OB, we're working with gestational diabetics most of the time because the type 2 diabetic, diabetics have trouble getting pregnant and staying pregnant. So, the majority of our clients become gestational diabetes. Okay. So, Preconception counseling. If we have an obese woman and she's wanting to be pregnant, she's 20 years old. We need to have her maybe lose some weight if her BMI is above 30 before she gets pregnant. Okay. So that she has a healthier pregnancy and healthier outcomes. Okay. If we help um, women with hyperglycemia control their glucose, during pregnancy, a really strict control, their risk for any problems, any poor outcomes are no different than someone who's not a diabetic, as long as she's controlling her sugar, okay? So strict blood glucose control prior to and during pregnancy and preconception counseling. These are two important things that we need to be aware of. Um, so some risk factors for diabetes, I've got some, uh, you should be able to figure some of this out. 
So what's the first one? What's a risk factor for anybody to develop diabetes? Family history. Family history is the first one. Obesity, whether it's a man or a woman, pregnant or not. What's the third one? Sedentary work. Yeah, sedentary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What about number four? Uh, poor diet. Is that number age? four? Age. Age is number four. Yeah. Age. Um, the older you get, the, the risk is greater to develop diabetes. Okay. So we screen with an A1C when you hit a certain age. Routine screening. I think it's 40. Uh, we do A1C, especially if there's a family history of diabetes or if the client's obese. What's number five? Who knows what that is? Gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes mellitus. Yeah. Does anybody know what R is? Brace. Brace. Good. Yeah. So this one is age. That's probably not any different than what you um, knew before. You hear that all the time on advertisements. So this next page, don't let it overwhelm you, but to help you understand the pathophysiology of hyperglycemia, what's going on in your blood? Why is there excess glucose in blood? Um, excess glucose in blood, of course, you know, is hyperglycemia, and it's because there's not adequate amount of insulin available for the cells to bring that glucose into the cells, okay? So some signs of hyperglycemia, whether you're pregnant or not, or I'm sorry, whether you're a diabetic or not, is glucose in the urine, glycosuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria. What's polydipsia? What do you think it means? Person. Yeah, you're dipping. So when I was a, a little girl and we'd go out to Kansas every summer and my grandparents lived on a farm in Kansas, they had no running water, but they had the best tasting well water. So every morning we'd go out to the well and fill a bucket full of ice cold well water and we bring it into the house and everybody shared the same bucket. We had a ladle on, on hanging on a hook right beside the bucket. And when you were thirsty, you dipped that ladle and you drank out of the bucket. We dipped into the bucket. That's how I remember. And so that's how you drank uh, water. So we call that polydipsia. When you're drinking a lot of water, that means you have a lot high glucose uh, in your blood. Polyphagia, what's that? Excessive eating. Yes. So phagia, like ma um, um, macrophages, um, they eat. Okay. So you're wanting to eat more. You're basically starving because your glucose can't get into the cell. Okay. So you're wanting to eat. You're trying to eat. And then polyuria. Excessive urination. Yes. Okay, so urinating a lot because when you have a lot of glucose in your blood, that draws fluid in and then you urinate a lot, okay? So if you have a client who has hyperglycemia, she's pregnant, she's getting into her late second trimester, she has hyperglycemia, okay? Let's say she's not really good at controlling her sugar. So she has hyperglycemia. Her fetus has hyperglycemia too, because glucose will pass right through, as you know, into the fetus. So because mother's urinating a lot more, so is fetus. So in essence, you have a lot of amniotic fluid because the baby is urinating a lot. Okay. Polyhydramnios. 
Okay. So if the mother's hyperglycemic, so is the baby. Okay. So that's why diabetic mothers or mothers that have hyperglycemia have big babies. Okay. So during pregnancy, if hyperglycemia runs rampant, a mother is more at risk to go into a metabolic acidosis. Okay, metabolic acidosis. Ketoacidosis is called because sugar is not available, so she burns ketones. She burns fats, which produces ketones. Okay. All right. So just some more pathology you can look at. So insulin, you know, type one is absolute in insulin deficiency. There's no insulin available. Type two is the most common, okay? Type two is also referred to as carbohydrate intolerance, insulin resistance, okay? Most diabetics are type two. So some things that you need to know about metabolic changes in pregnancy. So we know that the knee the meta metabolism increases during pregnancy, okay? We need uh, more calories, a few more calories, three or 400 more calories a day to help support a fetus, okay? Uh, insulin does not cross the placenta. Okay, the, the fetus can produce its own insulin about week 10. Okay, so what you need to understand here, early pregnancy, okay, those that first trimester, you might say, early pregnancy, the need for insulin actually is decreased. Okay. The need for insulin is decreased early in pregnancy. So if you have a type 2 or type 1 diabetic, we might have to adjust their medications early in pregnancy. But once we hit that 20th week, then the need for insulin begins to increase. Okay, So about mid-pregnancy, we're going to increase our diabetic medications. And this is also when we might see the development of the gestational diabetes. Okay. I know this is a lot, okay? So the need for insulin begins to increase starting week 20. And we refer to this time as the diabetogenic effects of pregnancy, okay? Um, insulin resistance, it's the cells that are resisting, okay? It's your the body's cells that are resisting the insulin. It takes more insulin to open the door to let that glucose in the cell. So poor glycemic control. So application of all this information I'm telling you about, how, what does that mean to us? How, how does that affect us as nurses with our diabetic clients? Poor glycemic control, we need to know if we have a type 1 or type 2 that become pregnant, they're at risk for losing a pregnancy, having a spontaneous abortion, if their glucose is not controlled when they get pregnant. It increases their risk to develop high blood pressure or hypertension because of their poor glycemic control. It causes um, polyhydramnios, we talked about, which puts them at risk for other things. They're at increased risk for preeclampsia, labor dystocia. Poor glycemic control is going to make a big baby. They might have to have a C section. Um, someone with hyperglycemia, they're at risk for infections all across the board, even med surge. Your diabetic clients are at risk for infections, okay, which leads to more insulin resistance. So it's a vicious cycle. So a woman with diabetes is also at risk to have a baby with a neurotube defect. 
So we do measure the uh, the AFP, remember, during that first trimester or second trimester. We do the maternal serum alpha protein, alpha fetoprotein, and that high AFP indicates neur neural tube defects. So for a diabetic or any high-risk person, we're doing more frequent ultrasounds um, during that late second and third trimester to monitor our fetus. So fetal risk, um, we think of congenital malformations. If mother's blood sugar is too high before she gets pregnant and early pregnancy, there's an increased incidence of congenital malformations. So the, I remember that client I told you about that was a diabetic and then went into heart failure. Her baby did not have any legs from the knee down. So, um, and she didn't keep the baby right away. When she got better and started feeling better, then she was able to take care of her own baby. And she came back to see us and she was adjusting well. She was uh, thankful that she survived. And now she had her baby, even though there was some some serious things going on with her baby. Now she, she was doing okay. So beginning the second uh, trimester, hyperglycemia, stillbirth, uh, or intrauterine fetal demise. Baby dies in utero before, before delivery. Extreme prematurity, prematurity, placental insufficiency. During labor, labor dystocia, shoulder dystocia. And this is because baby is so large, okay? After our baby is born, the baby it could very well experience what we call respiratory distress and fetal hypoglycemia. So if a baby is used to high levels of glucose and then all of a sudden you clamp the cord and baby's not eating anymore, their sugar drops very quickly. So we want our babies breastfeeding or bottle feeding as soon as possible after delivery, hopefully within the first hour or two. Okay. So as nurses, we need to be very vigilant at educating our clients about strict blood glucose control before and during pregnancy. We're gonna teach them how to monitor their blood glucose. Um, I used to give my, my clients a, um, I'd make it for them, a log. It was a piece of paper, as a form. And they were to put the time, the morning when they got up, what their blood glucose was, what they ate for, what time it was, what they ate for breakfast. What was their glucose two hours after they ate breakfast? What was their glucose before lunch? What did they eat lunch for lunch? And what time was it? Very detailed so that when they came back to see me, they brought that and we could look at patterns. If they ate this for lunch, their blood sugar two hours later, the postprandial blood sugars tended to be high. So we could adjust either diet or add some medication. Okay, so we have to help them understand their medications. So there's a lot of teaching and support that goes on with a diabetic client. So you need to know as a nurse, the symptoms of hypoglycemia and the symptoms of hyperglycemia. And you need to teach those to your client. So usually you think uh, tend to think of hypoglycemia as being wet, clammy, um, perspiring diaphoresis, weakness, blurred vision, some paresthesis, numbness. And then hyper is thirsty. They're dry. They're flushed. Their skin is flushed. Nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, acetone breath. Small respirations, deep 
rapid breathing is considered Cosma. Um, the client with their, their acidotic, so they're trying to blow off extra carbon dioxide. Okay, even though they're in metabolic acidosis, it helps to buffer by blowing off extra carbon dioxide. So what are some things to eat? I'm gonna teach your client what you should eat if you're hypoglycemic. A regular, a half a cup of regular soda, um, some orange juice, hard candies, cup of skin milk. Target ranges. Um, this is according to your text. What do we want her blood sugar to be before she eats breakfast? Before lunch, one hour after she eats, two hours after she eats, and then in the middle of the night, we don't ever want a client to drop below 60. So that's why most diabetics get an evening snack, protein snack, so they don't drop down too low. So hyper uh, diabetics, um, like I said, we're going to close, keep a closer eye on them during third trimester, do more frequent ultrasounds. We're going to watch baby's growth. We're going to do a fetal echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the baby's heart. We're going to do biophysical profiles to make sure baby is moving, got good muscle tone, breathing, looking at the amniotic fluid. We might do non-stress tests, teach mom about fetal kick counts. And then when she does go into labor, we got to balance her sugar. So we're going to have a maintenance IV. We're going to have D5W so we can give her some dextrose if she needs it. And we're going to have insulin IV available. Okay, so every hour we're going to check her sugar. If she's too low, we'll give her a little bit of D5W. If she's too high, we'll give her some insulin. Okay, so it's just keeping her at that good euglycemic area. So this is just going over some postpartum risk associated with hyperglycemia. Breastfeeding absolutely reduces the incidence of diabetes. So if a, if a diabetic mother or if a mother with um, gestational diabetics breastfeeds her baby for at least six months, it actually helps reduce the incidence of diabetes for that baby in adulthood. Okay. But there's also increased for hypoglycemia and a mother who breastfeeds. So she needs to eat before she actually breastfeeds, okay? She needs to eat no, um, uh, no longer than every four hours. At least every four hours, she needs to be eating something, okay? Because hypoglycemia can actually reduce milk production. Okay. So this is talking about the glucose tolerance test, which we do only to screen for gestational diabetes. Okay, and this is just your insulin. Okay, so that was a lot. It's okay. We'll go over it again. Um, let's take a break for about 15 minutes. Okay, and then we'll go over some of these other um, gestational high risk conditions.
Okay, so we're going to talk about gestational conditions. In other words, we have a healthy client, not a diabetic, no um, chronic illness going on, but something occurs during the pregnancy that's considered high risk. Okay, that's why it's called gestational conditions. So let me do a slideshow here. Okay. So one thing that can occur is your client during that very first trimester develops what we call hyperemesis gravidarum. Gravidarum just means pregnancy, right? Something occurring during the pregnancy. So you know what emesis is. So hyperemesis gravidarum, continuous vomiting, not be able to keep anything down, even ice, no water, nothing. Uh, they become very dehydrated. In fact, they'll probably end up in an emergency room because they haven't eaten or drank anything for several days um, and they're getting really sick. Um, so how do we know it's not just frequent nausea and vomiting versus hyperemesis? There is one way of actually diagnosing it. Does anybody know? Is it the number of times you get sick in a day? No, it's not based on how many times you have dry heaves or anything. It's based on um, actual um, lab work. So we're looking at um, drawing blood, okay? And if we see that the electrolytes are out of balance, in other words, she's hypokalemic, She's been vomiting so much, she's throwing up acid, so she's hypokalemic, then we have to diagnose hyperemesis gravidera, okay? But if her electrolytes are normal, then she actually doesn't have hyperemesis, okay? So it's a very serious con uh, condition to have someone who's been dehydrated for several days and vomiting. Um, they're, they're sick, they're very sick, so we have to rehydrate them. So if you have a client that comes into the hospital and she's a reproductive age when you look at her and she tells you she's been sick for days, the first thing somebody's going to ask her is, are you pregnant? And she says, I think I am. Then what is a priority at that point? She's in the emergency room. She's been vomiting for days. And it's obvious when you check her skin turgor, she's dehydrated. What would you do first? Mental status assessment and then vitals and then possibly IV fluids. Okay. So do you think that's the correct priority in that order? You're looking at your client. She's severely hydrated, dehydrated. She might even appear a little confused. She's flushed. I would check the hydration status first before anything. And what would you do? Administer a, probably a bolus, administer IV fluids, or try to okay. encourage her to drink. She can't drink, okay? So, so then priority. So priority in this situation is getting an IV in. Can you see that as physiologically being the greatest need? You don't need any more information. You don't need to assess her mental status. It's, it's, it's um, apparent she's dehydrated. Okay, if she tells you she hasn't had anything to drink for three days, she's dehydrated. So we're gonna get an IV started before we do anything else, okay? And then once we get her comfortable, we can begin more a more in-depth assessment. So what is the next thing you would want to do once you got that IV going? What other information or what other need does she have? What is a priority? Would you try to give her medication for the vodka? What about okay. an EKG? 
Okay. Because her electrolytes are out of balance, and then you need to see how the baby and her are both doing. Okay. So um, anti-emetic would be a good thing. What else do you want to know? She's reproductive age. Um, what else would you want, want to do besides maybe give her an anti-emetic, get her fluid, a bolus of fluid? What else would you want to know? Do you still need to do a pregnancy test? Okay, so how would we do that? You could do a blood test. Okay, okay, good. Or an ultrasound. An ultrasound, yeah. Ultrasound would be good. But we really need to know quantitative HCG, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you about that later. But we want to go, know for sure she's pregnant, okay? We want to give her her fluid first. Get her some antiemetics, draw some labs, right? We need to know if she's hypokalemic. We don't know for sure. We do want to draw some labs, okay? So we'll draw a CBC to make sure she doesn't have an infection. And we're going to draw chemistry, check her electrolytes and all her um, uh, electrolytes, okay? And we're going to get an ultrasound. Those are the first things we're going to do, okay? Can you see how how and why that's the priority in that order? We need to get her comfort level, okay? get her at a certain comfort level, and then begin further assessment. All right. Another problem we can see in pregnancy or that occurs during pregnancy is what? What's this a picture of? What do you see here? It's still on the title slide that says high risk perinatal. Yeah, it's not moving through the slides. Okay, just a minute. No line. Okay. So that one, you see that one now? Hyperemesis gravidarum. Yes, okay. So what's this one? Like, um, like, say like placenta detachment or? Ectopic. Ectopic, ectopic. This is the uterus here on the, on the, on the side, okay? This is down here is the ovary. Okay, this is a fallopian tube. The baby's inside that fallopian tube in bleeding. One of the risks associated with ectopic pregnancies is internal bleeding, a lot of bleeding. Okay, so a woman that comes to the office or comes to the emergency room with severe lower quadrant pain, either the right or the left, needs to be. We need to rule out an ectopic pregnancy before anything else, okay? Um, some providers, all they want to uh, assume is that she's got some kind of pelvic inflammatory disease. They forget they need to rule out ectopic pregnancy. So how would you rule this out? How would you know for sure she, if she has low right quadrant pain that it's ectopic? Ultrasound? Yeah, an ultrasound would show that she has an ectopic pregnancy. And they, the way that shows that is that you wouldn't see a baby in the uh, uterus, okay? You might see inflammation, collection of fluid over here, but you're not gonna actually see the baby over here, okay? So we have to get an ultrasound on this to differentiate, to do a differential diagnosis. So she would be in severe pain, okay? so. Um, it depends how far along she is. Most of the time, if she's gotten this far, uh, then we probably need to surgically go in there and remove that uh, embryo. And we might even have to remove the tube. Okay, so that's your ectopic pregnancy. Some other things that could go on is actual a spontaneous abortion during that first trimester, right? 
If you have a diabetic and she's not under control with her glucose, she might just spontaneously abort that baby. Okay, so there's different kinds of spontaneous abortions. It depends where they are in the process. So in this very first, um, let's see, this a little bit larger. Okay, in the very first um, one on the left, you'll notice there's a fetus in there. The cervix is closed and she's bleeding. We call this a threatened abortion. Okay, because the cervix is, I mean, the fetus is probably still alive and the cervix is closed. Even though she's bleeding, the cervix is closed. So it's not inevitable that she's going to lose this baby. Okay. She's not hurting. She's just bleeding a little bit. So we'll do an ultrasound. The next one is a client that calls the office and says she's really hurting and she's bleeding. Okay. And in this way, this way if she's got a lot of pain and she's bleeding, it's usually an inevitable abortion. In other words, she's losing the pregnancy. Okay. The cervix is open and she's bleeding. Even though you might see a fetus in the uterus, the fetus is probably not alive, okay? She's in the process of aborting her baby. And then the next one is called a missed abortion. There's no bleeding here. Um, and this would be example of, of a client that comes in at 10 weeks um, we do her history and her physical. I use my Doppler. I can hear fetal heartbeat. She comes back four weeks later for a checkup. I put my Doppler down and I can't hear heartbeat. The baby's died. Okay. She's not having any pain, no bleeding. The baby just died. It's called missed abortion because it's still there. And then, of course, the incomplete would be open cervix, heavy bleeding pain, some of the baby has passed, okay, but still retained uh, products of conception. So the two that you really need to be most familiar with are the threatened abortion, the cervix is closed, she's not having any pain, but she's bleeding a little bit, okay. That could indicate something else other than a threatened abortion, okay. The next one is she's hurting and she's bleeding. She's in that first trimester inevitable because the cervix is open and it's really bleeding. Here's a picture of, um, of a uterus um, with the bladder here. And you can see a little sac right there. Okay, let's change the subject a little. So let's define high blood pressure. And this is for pregnancy in particular. It used to be that American Heart Association diagnosed high blood pressure as greater than 140 or greater than one over 90, but now they've lowered that a little bit. Uh, my doctor tells me my blood pressure needs to be 120 or lower. And my blood pressure is never that low. <laughs> And they've tried medications. But um, so in pregnancy, we want the systolic pressure lower than 140, and we want the diagnostic or the diastolic uh, pressure below 90. Okay. If we measure our blood pressure in our client one day, and then four to six hours later, we recheck it and it's still high, we can diagnose her with gestational hypertension as long as she's past 20 weeks, okay? So that's how we define hypertension, okay? Chronic hypertension means that she had high blood pressure before 20 weeks. She had it when she got pregnant, okay? Uh, the problem with high blood pressure in pregnancy is that she's at risk for um, intrauterine growth restriction of her baby with central abruption, uh, superimposed preeclampsia, increased mortality and preterm birth. So let's look at these again. I wanna explain this to you a little better. 
So the difference between chronic hypertension versus gestational hypertension is the timing, okay? So at the top here, chronic hypertension history. The day she got pregnant, she already high, had high blood pressure. She had high blood pressure before she got pregnant. And so that's going to continue for her whole pregnancy, right? That's her history. Whereas gestational hypertension only occurs during pregnancy and it occurs after the 20th week and it's resolved at the end of the pregnancy. So that's what we mean by gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension means it only occurs during pregnancy. Okay, it, the pregnancy is causing it. Okay, got it? So let's talk about a phenomenon you've probably heard li little bits and pieces about. Uh, it's called preeclampsia. Um, preeclampsia is a phenomenon that we don't necessarily know what causes it. But we can associate a very unhealthy placenta, something about placenta in that connection with the, the, the uterine wall that's unhealthy. Um, the blood vessels, the maternal blood vessels and the fetal blood vessels tend to be smaller. And it happens like at a, one, a point in time when those blood vessels, especially from the mother, actually constrict. They squeeze and constrict and slow down. And when that happens, that you can see in this picture right here, the difference. The one on the top is a normal blood flow during pregnancy. So it goes from the mother all the way to the right to the placenta. So the blood flow, you can see the, the blood flow is widened there because we want low flow and we want lots of blood, okay, by the time it gets to the placenta. So the maternal arteries are dilated to benefit the placenta, okay? During preeclampsia, those blood vessels clamp up. It's, it occurs uh, at a moment in time and it re remains constricted. So it reduces uh, blood flow. It's a higher pressure. When this occurs, it's not only the placenta that's affected. And this is why you see other signs, okay? So if you have vaso, um, what I, vasoconstriction occurring in the placenta, it's also occurring in the kidneys, okay? So the kidney arteries begin to constrict. And that's why the blood pressure goes up, okay? So remember that high blood pressure does not cause preeclampsia. Preeclampsia causes high blood pressure, okay? So not only the kidneys, but the brain, the blood vessels in the cerebr um, cerebrum are clamping down. They're clamping down. The blood vessels in the lungs are clamping down. In the in the liver, clamping down. Okay, so it's just not the uterus, or not just the placenta that's being affected. It's the it's the brain, it's the lungs, it's the liver and the kidneys. So those are the four systems that we have to monitor when a client has preeclampsia. Okay, so. Who are the people or the women or the clients that are at risk to develop preeclampsia? African-Americans, okay? A family history of preeclampsia, chronic diseases, adolescents, women over 40, a woman who's had preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy, twins, triplets, Obesity, nicotine, poor nutrition. All these clients are at risk to develop preeclampsia. So here's another picture. 
So pre the pathophysia preeclampsia, it's a trigger. Okay. The placenta triggers system-wide vasospasm. So it reduces kidney perfusion, causing high blood pressure. And then vasospasms are also occurring in the brain, lung, uh, lungs, and liver. So if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see once again. The one all the way to the far right on the bottom is a normal pregnancy. Look how dilated that maternal artery is for that placenta. And then look how dilated preeclampsia is. Not much. It's squeezed. That's the one in the middle. And the one to the far left is a non-pregnant blood vessel. Maternal blood vessel. So the, the red at the top where it says non-pregnant preeclampsia at norm, that's the baby side. That's the placenta, okay? The bottom is mom. So what does all this mean? Okay. So preeclampsia, Once this chart is good because it, it describes gestational hypertension, what it is. It's just high blood pressure. Nothing else is going on, just high blood pressure. No signs of preeclampsia. Usually when we suspect preeclampsia, a client will come into the office, okay? So let's say, um, I'm gonna pull this down a little bit. A client calls the office, she's 34 weeks pregnant, okay? And let's say she is a diabetic. She calls you off and says, um, Nurse Davis, I've had a headache today, all day, I've taken, all the Tylenol I can possibly take, and it's not going away. Nurse Davis, is he listening? <laughs> Nurse Davis, Thomas, <laughs> you're talking to your client on the phone, and she says she's had a headache all day, and um, and it won't go away. She's taking Tylenol. One of the first signs, clinical, I should say, clinical symptoms of preeclampsia is a headache. Okay, one of the first symptoms is a client that calls and complains about a headache unrelieved with Tylenol. So when she comes into the office, Nurse Davis knows. He knows she's complained about um, headache. He knows she's a diabetic and he already suspects preeclampsia. So the first thing he's going to do when she gets there is take her blood pressure. Because if she has preeclampsia, she's going to have high blood pressure. And sure enough, her blood pressure is 150 over 90. Okay. And another thing he can do is he can check her urine and he can dip, you know, during a urine dipstick into the urine and it's going to be two plus protein or greater. Those are the two most common symptoms and signs of preeclampsia. Three. Okay. High blood pressure, headache, proteinuria. Okay. That's enough to make you able to diagnose her with preeclampsia, okay? Now, why proteinuria? Why is there protein in the urine? Because the kidneys are being stressed, okay? Anybody with kidney disease is gonna have protein in their urine. The kidneys are not able to filter out the protein or reabsorb the protein, okay? So because the kidneys are being damaged, you're going to see creatinine levels increase greater than 1.1. Okay, so those are the kidneys. The brain, okay, if, there, if there's uh, vasospasms in the brain, what kind of symptoms other than visual symptoms might a client complain about? Go ahead, be brave. The brain, what's going on in the brain? Vasospasms, what is she going to feel? Sharp pain. Headache, yeah, that headache we talked about. That's a cere cerebral spasms, okay? She might also see spots or flashes of light, okay? Visual changes, that's her brain, okay? Now her lungs, her lungs are also receiving spasms. So she's gonna have shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, 
okay? And then the liver. The liver is the last. So you're going to see elevated liver enzymes. AST and ALT will elevate. And then thrombocytopenia, which is what? Low platelet Her count. Low platelet count, okay? Low platelet count. Now, if preeclampsia becomes more severe, the blood pressure goes up. It's the liver that we see the most affected, and that is what we call HELP syndrome. So you're going to see worsening of liver measurements. You're going to see higher AST, higher ALT, lower platelet level, and then actually hemolysis, the breakdown of red blood cells. So you're going to see some bleeding. If we don't intervene at some point, she's going to have a seizure. Okay, It's going to be like a grand mal seizure. Okay, That's what we call eclampsia. So here's again, this is the liver being affected by preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets, HELP. So once again, when preeclampsia begins, she's going to have a headache. Her blood pressure is going to go up. We need to do a neuro assessment. What's her level of consciousness? We need to assess her deep tendon reflexes because if she has positive clonus, she has an eminent uh, or impending, what I want to say, eminent um, seizure activity. Okay, so deep tendon, hyperactive deep tendons indicate cerebral irritability. So she's going to have a seizure. We need to assess her cardiovascular system. Listen to her heart. What's her blood pressure? She having trouble breathing. What's is, What about peripheral pulses, edema? Check her urine output. The kidneys, not only would you see protein in her kidneys, but her kidneys are, are being injured. So you're going to see reduced urine output. I'm going to put this all together for you in a minute. So here again, these are pictures of deep tendon reflexes. So brisker, a grade three is brisker. So if you have a client with a grade three, you watch them closely. Okay. And then grade four. Grade four is, it's going to happen. She's going to have um, a seizure. How do we treat um, preeclampsia? Or is it magnesium sulfate? Drug of choice for preeclampsia. Okay, preeclampsia is a central nervous system depressant. Okay, it's going to make that brain relax. Okay, we do, and you've already done some magnesium problems. We do a loading dose. We give her uh, four to six grams over 30 minutes or so. And then we begin a maintenance dose. Okay, so remember our assessments. Okay, prior to treatment, during treatment, what's going on with our client. A therapeutic range of magnesium sulfate. Once we get it infusing, our client is gonna be alert and oriented. She's not gonna have a headache, no visual changes. Her deep tendon reflexes are gonna be normal and she's gonna have good urine output between 30 and 40 mL an hour, okay? Blood pressure is gonna be good. If she's, if that level of magnesium is not therapeutic, it's less than what it needs to be, then she's going to have hyperactive reflexes and her urine output is going to be down. If she becomes toxic, okay, in other words, if the level of magnesium in her blood reaches greater than seven milligrams per deciliter, you don't have to know that. You need to know what she is, what clinical signs are with toxicity, lethargy, confusion, headache, blurred vision, 
diminished accommodation and convert slurred speech, hypoactive reflexes, hypotension and bradycardia, muscle weakness, urine output shut down. Okay. Okay. So let's kind of put this together. I know it's a lot. So you have a 32 year old diabetic client who's admitted to the OB unit, to the high-risk OB unit. I need to put that in there, don't I? Because she has to be monitored very carefully. High-risk OB unit with preeclampsia, okay? What would her vital signs be? What would you expect her vital signs to be? Blood pressure to be high, greater than 150 over 90. Okay, so she's going to have hypertension. Okay. What symptoms might she complain about? A headache uh, or like blurred vision or like seeing glares. Okay. Um, um, seeing um, spots, flashes of lights, flashes of light. What else might she be experiencing? Think about the brain, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys. She could be a little bit uh, irritated. Okay. She might be short of breath, right? And she might have some edema. Okay. Um, decreased urine output. Okay. How do we diagnose preeclampsia? Blood pressure. Hypertension with one other symptom. Yeah, it's all we need. So one of those symptoms could be a headache, protein in the urine, or elevated liver enzymes, any one of those other symptoms or signs. She has to have high blood pressure, but typically we have, she has a headache and some protein in her urine. So um, one thing, um, I'd like to teach preeclampsia this way because it helps you determine how to monitor and how we treat it. What are your interventions? So if you have a client with preeclampsia and she's having these symptoms and signs, and we're going to go ahead and get some magnesium started right away, okay? Um, they have done some research in preeclampsia. They've done brain scans of a client with preeclampsia. And what they found is that these women have high levels of calcium circulating around the cerebral arteries. And that's why they're clamping down. Okay. So because there's high levels of calcium, we're going to give her magnesium. Okay. So with preeclampsia, um, I'm gonna add this in here. Calcium and magnesium, they have an indirect relationship. The higher the calcium, the lower the magnesium level, okay? If we increase the magnesium level in her blood and in her brain, it reduces calcium levels and it reduces central nurse, nervous system activity. So doing the magnesium helps um, reduce or increase the threshold for seizures. In other words, she's not gonna have a seizure as readily if we give her magnesium, okay? They have an indirect relationship. In fact, magnesium and calcium have an indirect relationship throughout the body. If you have high calcium levels in your blood, you probably have low magnesium. Okay, so in particularly the brain. So that's why she has a headache because her calcium levels are too high. 
So we give her magnesium. Okay, we'll practice that. So something else that can occur during pregnancy that's considered high risk is abruptio placenta. A placenta that pulls away from the uterus too early, either from trauma or during labor, uh, maybe a very fast precipitous labor, or maybe a, um, a woman that's on cocaine, trauma too much amniotic fluid. The placenta pulls away way too early and there's massive bleeding and the, the mortality rate is really high for mother and baby because of the blood loss. So if you see a gush of blood, uh, do you know what some of the symptoms are of a, an abrupt placenta? Abdominal pain. Yeah, sharp abdominal pain, a very rigid abdomen, a very rigid abdomen, sharp pain, mm -hmm. massive bleeding. Here's a picture. There's different grades of separation, but for the purposes of this class, we're talking about more of a uh, an abruption that's life-threatening. So because of partial separation, it's concealed and there might not be that much bleeding, but we're talking about massive bleeding when there's sudden pain. So motor vehicle accident, things like that. And then uh, we, let me talk about this one first. So if we compare that with placenta previa, okay? Placenta previa is different, okay? It's painless, okay? So usually early in pregnancy, we have a uterus with the placenta, right? And as that uterus grows, the placenta will end up usually around the top of the uterus. But some placentas are low lying in the uterus. So with that, you can see how some of the placenta might be covering the opening, the internal os and bleeding. So that edge of the placenta doesn't have anything to attach to, so it might bleed. So your client's gonna have some bleeding during pregnancy. This can occur during the second trimester and the third trimester. If you have a client with a previa, she's gonna be on some restrictions, okay? She's gonna feel a lot of pelvic pressure because of that heavy placenta down on the bottom and she's gonna be bleeding. So we monitor her as long as a baby is doing fine, um, we're not gonna do anything, okay? What, if she starts bleeding a lot though, we're gonna see changes in fetal monitoring. Okay. So these babies have to be delivered by C-section. There's no way to control the bleeding if we let her go into labor. She's just going to bleed, bleed, bleed. And the baby will not be able to descend. So if you look at this picture on the left, oops, eh, you can see where that, that placenta, the baby's head is right against that placenta. So we wouldn't be able to deliver that baby. So that's called a previa. The word previa means first. In other words, it's headed out the, the um, cervix before the baby. It's previa. So there's no pain, okay? There's no pain with this. Whereas for an abruption, it's painful and it's usually sudden, okay? All right. Homeostasis in pregnancy. You know that during pregnancy, things change. Um, we have a more capability of clotting in the blood. Okay. So homeostasis means to balance blood loss with blood clotting. Okay. We have the homeostatic system that stops blood flow. 
and we have the fibrinolytic system, which breaks down fibrin clots. It's a balance, okay? So we know that during pregnancy, he's more apt to have blood clots, okay? Because we don't want those blood clots. And, and the reason this is, the reason it's set up is because to help prevent postpartum um, hemorrhaging, okay? So look in the text, if you didn't look at this before your quiz, some signs of hemorrhagic shock, postpartum shock. Um, some, ca some causes of postpartum hemorrhage could be abortions, um, medical abortions that steal some content of the fetus remains. Placental abruption can cause hemorrhage. It does cause hemorrhage. A molar pregnancy, which I think I lost that slide. Uh, and trauma, okay? A molar pregnancy is not a true pregnancy. Um, I missed that. I'll have to go over that a different time. Okay, so some clinical signs of... Um, I'm sorry? I have a question real fast. So... Yeah. The molar pregnancy, is that just the cyst on the placenta? It, molar pregnancy is this so right here. You can't hear? Oh, I hear it. Yeah. Okay. So this is a uh, a um, a molar pregnancy right here. Remember, I did show this slide. So a molar pregnancy is nothing but a bunch of cysts. It's not a true um, pregnancy. It what happens is that the egg uh, is doesn't have the adequate chromosomal uh, amount or doesn't have any maternal chromosome information, okay? It might've been impregnated with a sperm and the sperm has the its own chromosome and DNA, but the egg itself doesn't have any D DNA, okay? So there's no embryo. HCG levels are gonna be very high, okay? Remember we were talking about this client back here hyperemesis gravidarum, how we differentiated what was going on by doing lab work and doing an ultrasound and getting a quantitative HCG. If we did an ultrasound, we wouldn't see a pregnancy. We would see a molar pregnancy if it was truly molar instead of hyperemesis. And we would see very high HCG levels and she would still be nauseous and vomiting. So we have to differentiate, is it a molar pregnancy or is it an ectopic pregnancy or is it hyperemesis gravidarum, okay? So that's a scenario, scenario we could work through, okay? What is our priority when she comes in? Well, we need to get an IV started to give her some comfort, right? Give her some antiemetics. We need an ultrasound. We need an HCG level. We need labs. We need our uh, electrolytes. We need to get all that information, all that data, so we can analyze it and come up with a diagnosis. And the diagnosis could be hyperemesis, because the HCG would be normally, um, have, depends how far along she was, but her labs would be off, okay? She'd be dehydrated. A molar pregnancy, uh, ultrasound wouldn't show a true pregnancy, but her HCG levels would be very high. And molar pregnancies also um, are precancerous, actually. We have to do a dilate, uh, di uh, dilation and curatage, DNC, we call them. We go in there and remove all that tissue and then we monitor her uh, for HCG levels for the next full year. If her HCG levels continue to be present, then we're concerned about cancer. These are trophoblastic cysts, they're called. Trophoblastic cysts. And then another thing that can occur is a cervix at the beginning of the pregnancy that's too short. 
and it can't contain the pregnancy. A lazy cervix, it wants to dilate too early in her pregnancy and it, or it's too short. And what we do is we, we put a band around it. It's called a cerclage to contain the pregnancy. And then we'll just leave it there until she's about 36 weeks pregnant. And then we'll remove it if it's a vaginal cerclage. And she can go into labor then. So will that patient have to be on bed rest so that the gravity isn't pushing? Uh, not necessarily, no. Because we, we put a clamp on it. We put a clamp on it. I know that this week, let's see. I know that this week there's a lot of information. And it's just like I have to zip, zip, zip through it. Okay. It would be good, you know, if you looked at those PowerPoints again and go to your book and read. And I will provide you with other documents as well to help you with this. And I will also meet with you if you need me to talk more about preeclampsia. We will be doing more preeclampsia. Okay. We will, during uh, review sessions, we'll be talking about this. Okay. And I have a case study of a client that actually develops preeclampsia that I will be doing and sharing with you uh, before the next exam. Okay. Anybody, make, make sure this week you send me your calculations before you submit them. So I can see them and look at how you have it set up. And if you didn't get the correct answer, I'll tell you why you didn't get the correct answer and help you reset them up so that you can submit them when they're correct, okay? All right, <laughs> okay. Would it help you if I took the concepts, each one of these concepts separately from this week and made a quick video? And just explain that concept individually. Would that help you? I've always wondered if that would help. And then I could post the, the individual ones, the video. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. But for the diabetic one, um, remember those, what I showed you at the very beginning of the class, that the orange. Do you remember that? that you took a screenshot of, let's see. Oh, I know it's in the announcements that you couldn't see it. Okay, I'll get that to you too, because that really tells you as a nurse, what does that mean to you? You might be able to explain the pathology of um, diabetes, but if you can't apply that information with your client, you don't know what to see, what it looks like in your client. You don't know how to intervene. You don't know what the care plan would be. What good does it do you to understand the details of pathophysiology, you know, about all of that? What should you be doing, you know, as a nurse? Who's at risk for preeclampsia? What does it look like? What are some things you would see? How do you measure it? How do you intervene? How do you monitor that it's working, your intervention? So client calls the office, they have a headache. One of the first things you would think of should come to your mind is preeclampsia. So you want to get their blood pressure. You want to check their urine, and then you're going to do some labs. Once we get her in the hospital and put her on magnesium, what are you looking for? Is it working? Does she still have a headache? Or is she becoming toxic? What does she look like if she's toxic? So it's not understanding that, yeah, there's spasms going on everywhere. But what does that mean for you as a nurse? What would I see? Okay. All righty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll work on some videos, okay, so you can uh, learn a little bit. But, you know, go to your book. Your book's got great pictures and stuff. I'm all about pictures. Makes sense. Okay? All right. 
So you may sign off now. And I'm just going to hang out till everybody is satisfied with um, the